All right, so today we are going to be talking about uh, the Etruscan Orientalizing period. So, do we call it Orientalizing, or should we maybe call it Urbanizing? Um, the period in question lasts roughly from 750 to 580 BCE. It's interesting to note that this start time of 750 is right around the same time that the Etruscans are adopting a writing system from uh, the Greeks down near Cumae. And so it seems that the writing, uh, the idea of putting down written records does kind of help move along this uh, urbanizing and orientalizing process. Now, why am I questioning between orientalizing and urbanizing? Well, orientalizing for a long time, well, it refers to the Near Eastern influences on the Etruscans, uh, the Neo-Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Achaemenid Persians that are influencing the way Etruscan art is being done. So you have this sphinx here from Achaemenid Persian, and when you look, it has similar qualities to this sphinx from Poggio Civitate Merlot, with the high wings uh, as a, and the stiff kind of body. So you can see some of these influences happening. However, scholars have often seen it only as influences going from the east to the Etruscans and disregarding any possibilities of the Etruscans influencing the uh, uh, civilizations towards the east, even including uh, influencing the Greeks. We are starting to rethink that, and hence the, the different, the slow move away from orientalizing as a term. Now, urbanizing is a more neutral term, and it re merely refers to the creation of cities. Now, whichever term we decide to pick to describe this period, um, it's a period of vast and distinct changes going on. Uh, so, so, ch so new and novel are these changes that early scholars thought it was an entire different culture coming in and taking over for the Villanovan periods. We've since proven that that it's the Villanovans were early Etruscans uh, and you can watch that in the Iron Age and, and learn about that from the Iron Age video um, but the urbanizing or orientalizing period is one of very distinct changes in, in, in a lot of growth in the Etruscan world so what is growing well we see in, uh, we see a growth in wealth in new technologies in the cities so in wealth, we see this evidence in terms of increased trade. So here we have a skiffos from found at QZ. Uh, it's a, an Attic red figure skiffos. And so it's, it's clear evidence of the Athenians sending and, and shipping objects into to be used by the Etruscans. Um, in terms of new technologies, we can see the use and adoption of clay roofs. Uh, so here, uh, in the foreground, we have a thatched roof hut. In the background, we have a, a reconstruction of what the orientalizing workshop at Poggio Civitate would have looked like, which had on it a, a terracotta roof. Um, so there's this this growth in use of this this roofing technology. Um, and in terms of of cities, we see a consolidation of of little villages. So each village would have had. And we can see this through the consolidation also of cemeteries. All right, so here's a map of the area around Tarquinia. Um, and we can see all these uh, little dots around here are all Iron Age cemeteries. And in the Orientalizing period, all these cemeteries move to the Monterozzi necropolis, the famous painted tombs of Tarquinia. All right, and so it seems that what once was personal village cemeteries with a bunch of small settlements gets coalesced into this central city all right now i don't want you to think that this this centralization of cities means a centralization of the entire area of etruria there was no central etruscan government as we know it there's this reference in livy uh to the 12 cities and some sort of alliance but um, it, there's no central government like we see in uh, Rome, where everything's centered around the city of Rome. Uh, but we do see a consolidation of villages into central cities, at least. All right. So I mentioned trade in the last slide, and I talked about that Attic red figure Skiphos. Um, well, this is a map of the seventh of the seventh century. Um, 
showing the different um, groups that were in major players that were around at this time. So here over in Mesopotamia, we have the Assyrian Empire, which breaks down into uh, the Median Kingdom, uh, the Kingdom of Sardis, the Kingdom of Babylon and Egypt, uh, which eventually gets taken over by the Persians. We have the Greeks, which have expanded like wildfire across there, setting up trade posts all over the place. Originally starting here in Greece and the Greek islands, moving into the Black Sea, over to Sicily, and then over here to the south of France. And then here we have the Phoenicians. Um, we have the Carthaginians uh, who are here around Carthage in North Africa and into Corsica in Spain. All right, so we have a lot of groups spread out along the coast of, of the Mediterranean world. Um, not to say that there aren't people inland, there are, but they aren't as major players in the 7th century. All right, so you can see how Etruria here in the middle, in the yellow, is a very central location to contact with the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Um, and the Phoenicians have contacts back over here in uh, Phoenicia with their home cities. And so there's a lot of places for trade to be happening. Um, Further evidence of this trade beyond just the materials uh, being used is also uh, the connection of writing. So here in Pirgi, uh, which is the port town of Kaire or modern day Trevetri, we find these three golden tablets that were attached to the temples in uh, the, this port town. Now they're a little bit on the late side of the orientalizing period, but uh, those dates are very, very fluid, and so um, this can st is still a sign of a very much increased trade uh, inc that had been increasing through the entire Orientalizing period up until this point. And so these tablets are dedications written by both Etruscan and Phoenician um, to, for the temple, and it shows this um, c this importance of having not only a place for the Etruscans to worship, but also for the Phoenician um, merchants that are moving around. And to have a temple must mean there's a lot of movement going on. All right. So these gold tablets are a further sign of this interconnectivity of through trade in the Mediterranean world at this time. All right. To talk more about the growth of cities, we uh, we obviously see this change in uh, from villages, small villages, and, and farming communities into towns. All right, and we start to see more public works being done. Uh, we have reservoirs being created, sewer systems being created. Um, here we have uh, we have the walls from the town of Rosselle created in around the sixth century. All right, and all these are not only increases of of comforts for people with the sewers and the reservoirs, but also a, a, a sign of increased protection. It's easier to protect a group of people if they're all connected, group, grouped into one location, as opposed to spread out over a bunch of villages. And this increased protection, need for protection, shows an in, a sign of increased conflict and competition for resources. All right. Um, and it seems that during the, or, the orientalizing and urbanize, slash urbanizing period, there's a lot more conflict uh, and competition going on. Now, does this mean there was none going on in the Iron Age? Probably not. Um, the idea that the Iron Age is egalitarian and perfectly peaceful is, is a very naive one. Uh, but it definitely shows that the ur urbanizing period, there, there's a, an increased need for protection with the idea of increased trade and wealth and scarcity of resources and competition over those resources to then trade again and gain more wealth, there's a, there's a lot of conflict that's going to start picking up during this time period. All right, and so what is this wealth? Well, um, it's different. Etruscan wealth is different from wealth in modern day uh, Colorado. All right. Um, while there are crude bronzes in shape that seem to be referring to um, money, we can't really be sure about that. There's no, there's not really like a money backed by a government, uh, you know, like we have here in the United States. All right, wealth for the Etruscans is a control of resources. All right, so the ability to control people and raw materials um, is is your sign of wealth. All right, and you display this wealth in different ways. You display it in banquets. Um, this is a display case in the museum at Merlot, full of a bunch of banqueting wares. You have cups here and bowls and little servant trays and amphoras down here. So all these these um, 
vessels are used to have uh, banquets where you invite your your con your constituents, your pe the people you have control over, um, as a display of this is why I control you because I have all this wealth. All right. We also see the use of new technologies like the terracotta roof. All right. The terracotta roof is new not only in Italy but also in Greece, and it's um, a very expensive uh, endeavor to do. It's easier to make thatch. Reeds grow everywhere. You can bundle them together, throw them on top, and it's easier to put a thatch roof up than it is a terracotta roof. You need to collect the clay. You need to purify the clay. You need to then form the clay. You need to then let the clay dry and then fire it in a kiln. And these clay, um, these terracotta tiles are large and heavy. All right, and then on top of the tiles, we have all these decorations along the cymas, the rake and cyma here, and the lateral cyma here, and these freeze plaques down here, and then seated figures and, and other figures all over along the ridge. Now, this is the archaic roof, but the orientalizing roof is very similar in shape as well, and would have constituted a lot of the similar elements. And so it's a large amount of resources you're controlling with the clay and the wood and the manpower to create this. So if you're able to control this, you're able, you have a lot of wealth. Then the last one is lavish tombs. And so the Regolini Galassi tomb in, near uh, Cairo is one of the best examples of this. It's a large tumulus seen reconstructed here in the middle um, that has a lot of wealthy, uh, expensive artifacts um, placed inside. Gold, like this giant brooch, which is one of the icon, uh, um, icons from it, or this, this bronze bed here on the other side. Um, these objects are, are clearly intrinsically valuable, and to be able to put them into a tomb is, a, is an important thing instead of just merely reusing them. Uh, you are, you're killing off these artifacts, so to quote unquote, um, and, and putting them out of commission. And so if you can do that, it must mean you have a lot more to back them up to use in your, in, in your everyday life. And then to build a tomb, tumulus this large is, is, is a massive control of resources. All right, this is a, a reconstruction of what the inside looked like of the tomb when they found it. Um, and this is one of the bronze shields that you can see here on the side. Again, a lot of wealthy objects in here. And we see this This is not a, um, a singular event. These tombs are popping up all over the place and occurring in different variations across um, Etruria at this time. There's actually a very interesting group right now, uh, Etrus Scanning. Uh, which is trying to recreate digitally the inside of the Regolini Galassi tomb. They have a WordPress blog that I highly recommend checking out, which has all this interesting information and reconstructions, and where some of the uh, where these drawings are coming from. All right, we also see a diversification of tomb types in the Orientalizing period. During the Iron Age period, we had a very singular type of tomb, the biconical urn. All right, which was everyone was buried in for the most part. Um, not to say that they didn't do uh, inhumations, but it seems cremations were a very co more common thing. Um, in the Orientalizing period, we start to see changes in that. Um, in the south here, uh, with these stars, we see tumulus tombs. And Poggio Civitate also has a tumulus in its necropolis. So Caire and Vei and Tarquinia all have these tumuli. While we also start to see um, more rock-cut tombs, such as in Volci and, and San Giovanale. And then in Cusi and Volterra, we, start to, we see the continuation of cremation urns. All right, so we have this diversification of tomb types as people are, are trying to put on different displays of wealth. So here we have a, a tomb list from Cairo, uh, not the Regolini Galassi tumulus. Unfortunately, that just has a building on top of it right now. But this uh, is one of the ones in the Banditachi um, cemetery. And you can see how large it is and how much time it would have taken to put it together. Uh, we also have at Cairo, um, this is one example of the types of sarcophagus that are coming out of there. Again, a lot of time and, and energy is going into this, and it's, it's this display of wealth that is exploding throughout the Orientalizing period. Here we have um, at Tarquinia, the painted tumulus is the Tomb of the Panther. Um, 
And these paintings are, are interesting displays of rituals for death, but it also is a, a sign that you can afford to pay someone to work underground and paint a tomb that you're then going to seal up and visit very infrequently. It's an intra it's a, another way of displaying this wealth that's coming out around at the t this time. Here are some of the rock cut tombs that we have at San Giovanni. And there will be a link in the comment section or in the description of this uh, to a video created and talking more about uh, what's going on at San Giovanale, uh, created by uh, Ryan Baker and uh, Frederick Tobin, uh, the current excavator or uh, surveyor at of these tombs here. But these rock cut tombs into the into the stone facing uh, is a, a, another one of the diversifications of the tomb types at this time. And then here, finally, we have uh, the cremation burials, an example of them from at QZ. Uh, this is earlier in the Orientalizing period. This is tw more towards the Hellenistic period, but it just shows how long uh, the idea of cremation burial was still important to the QZN people. Um, and still, but uh, still they're able to display these different aspects of, of wealth in their time period. So... The orientalizing slash urbanizing period can be remembered for three main things, all right? It can be remembered for the consolidation of villages into cities, an explosion of wealth, and with this wealth, an explosion of displays of it with, through banquets and technology and burial styles, all right? So that's it for the orientalizing period today. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below or email me. And I look forward for you, to, for you guys to come back and see the next video.